Hi, this is Sarah Butcher. Welcome to The Side Comment. This April, India, now the most populous country in the world and the largest democracy, will begin the seven-phase process of their general election for the 543 members of the Lok Sabha House of Parliament. TV Paul is a recognized authority on international security in South Asia and has joined us to discuss five essential questions about India's economic, military, and soft power rise in the past 30 years that will shape the outcome of this spring's election. I'm TV Paul. I'm a professor at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. I am a specialist in international relations, international security, Asia Pacific, in particular, uh, India and South Asia. My forthcoming book uh, titled The Unfinished Quest, India's Search for Major Power Status from Nehru to Modi is expected to be published from Oxford University Press. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the major themes relating to that book connected to the forthcoming general elections in India. As uh, generally known that India is the world's largest democracy uh, and the 543 member lower house of Indian parliament uh, elections to that body will take place in April, May 2024. And it is happening in the context of India's rise as a major power and that Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who is uh, expected to win uh, the elections a third time, and using the India Rising slogan as for his success. In this backdrop, I raise five questions on India's rise, its emerging trajectory, and in particular, the domestic and international implications of the general elections. So the first question is, is India rising? Yes, indeed, in a relative sense, it's the most successful rising power after China in today's world order. Ever since its economic liberalization of 1991, India has been steadily rising from an aspirational power to a rising power. But its power position is not institutionalized. A number of favorable geopolitical conditions have arisen, in particular the rise of China and the US embrace of India as a swing power to balance China's aggressive rise in the Indo-Pacific. The second question is, what is the basis of this claim? Since 1991, economic reforms, India has come a long way. Uh, its uh, major progress has been made in both economic, military, and other soft power indicators. And these um, indicators give it an advantage over most other rising powers in today's world. And one has to accept that uh, today, India is the fastest growing world economy. So I would give the economic dimension most prominence in this set of factors. India's rising claim has been largely possible due to its steady economic growth, ranging from 6 to 8% annually. And it is now a part of the globalized world economy, especially in trade, investment, and labor sectors. So it's a 4.1 trillion economy, fifth largest in the world, uh, and in purchasing power parity terms, the third largest. And it is poised to become number three economy by 2030 and number two economy by 2050, assuming things don't go bad in many areas. Now, most of the countries have accepted India's rise to some extent. Um, it has been uh, included in many international institutions, a steady stream of uh, visitors um, go to India, and all U.S. leaders since George W. Bush have recognized India's rise. And President Obama even stated in the Indian parliament that India is not just rising, it is risen. So actually, the 2005 U.S.-India nuclear accord was pivotal for accommodation of India. Until then, India and U.S. were called the estranged democracies. But India's position is very much still in the making, partly because the great power club is frozen, 
since 1945, San Francisco Accord. There is no peaceful mechanism to include a new power into the midst of this uh, great power club. So we have a challenge at the international level, how to accommodate peacefully a latecomer. Yes, India's uh, growth has been impressive, but what are the constraints? That's my third question. There are several constraints. Some are international. I just mentioned about the problem of uh, accommodating a new power. But it quite a bit is internal. India has a big challenge with human development index. The 2023 Human Development Report placed India 134 out of 193 countries, which itself is considered as a slight improvement from previous years. The gap between the rich and poor is widening in India, perhaps more than any other developing country at this point. It creates a number of billionaires a year, and so India has some advantages, and one is called the demographic dividend in terms of the working age population between 18 and 35, which is numbered some 600 million. But my contention is that this particular asset that India has is not fully utilized yet because of limitations in educational institutions as well as skill set development. So a number of Indian youth migrate to the rest of the world, especially the West and the Gulf, for employment and education. And we have not been able to see the demographic dividend utilized in India, given that the huge unemployment rate in India today. Now, even in the uh, military sector, it's considered as the third largest military power, but it is facing two active border uh, with Pakistan and with China border conflicts, and that really constrains its ability to spend uh, in a big way on naval power, which is essential for claiming a global power status when it comes to the Indo-Pacific. Now, the fourth question I have is, will the 2024 elections, which will take place in April uh, or May, be a turning point in this process? I, do, I see two dimensions here. First, India's status advancement in recent years has benefited the ruling establishment, especially the Bharatiya Janata Party that Mr. Modi leads. The claim that India is no more respected and its global status and power positions are well entrenched thanks to the prime minister's efforts is very much part of the campaign narrative of the BJP. The growing Hindu middle class seems to agree. According to a Pew report in February 2023, Modi had some 79% approval rating of those surveyed. More interestingly, some 70% of Indians think a strong leader like Modi is needed for India to progress. Many of the social programs that Mr. Modi has implemented were started during the previous Congress regime was in power. The Modi government has improvised the delivery of them by introducing direct transfer and added a few welfare programs. The previous Congress regime's inability to cash in on their achievements for electoral gains are in direct contrast to Mr. Modi's success in presenting a different image to the public on India's economic and military achievements. The Prime Minister has used social media platforms and diaspora more effectively than previous leaders ever did. He has visited a number of countries with much fanfare and courted world leaders for India's policy goals. So this is actually a big dimension of how international status gains are used for electoral purposes in India today. The fifth question is, what are the implications of BJP winning a third term for India's further rise and its foreign relations? I believe that the Modi government will continue much of what it is doing today. It will put a lot of emphasis on accelerating the economic growth, uh, partly because it is benefiting from U.S. and uh, Western companies pulling out of China, probably less than what it could do. But this conflict with China is a big challenge for India. The border is now more active. There are quite a few crises happening periodically. But India is also seeking what you call a policy of strategic autonomy. And it has called this as multi-alignment, which means it will not abandon its close ties with Russia. This is a problem for the West, 
But on the other hand, the Indian argument is that if India gives up on Russia, Russia will form an alliance with China, which is bad for both India as well as for the West. There is some point in that claim. A great power war involving the U.S. and China or Russia is not in India's interest. India would like to become a next major power without a war. And it is pinning its hopes on the progress that it is making. Now, the relations with the U.S. is very pivotal here. And for that reason alone, the U.S. is somewhat less critical of India's democratic backsliding that has been going on under Mr. Modi. Quite a bit of uh, restrictions on freedoms are happening in India today. So India will engage in all partners, and it has two policies, look east and act east, engaging the uh, East Asian and Southeast Asian partners, as well as Middle East, and have made a number of deals, uh, mostly preferred what you call uh, direct deals with countries, free trade agreements. And as a result, it is expected to grow much bigger than it is today. Now, I would say that uh, despite the backsliding, democratic backsliding, the China factor is not going to go away. And this gives India considerable advantage. Indian migrants or labor force is needed in almost every Western country, as there is a surplus of them. India's greater inclusion in global governance is needed for equity and global efforts to solve collective action problems. And this, I think, is where India's claims should be uh, better presented, because I think India acts sometimes as a veto player, which is not helping much, but it has to definitely come with its own solutions, which is often difficult in many, many issue areas, like climate change or global trade talks. So finally, I would argue that the peaceful accommodation of India will alter the historical pattern of rise and fall of great powers through war. In the 21st century international order, India certainly is going to be a player, although this process is long and cumbersome. Thank you.